Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Jose, and uh, a happy Easter to you all. We're uh, going to continue. Yes, he has. Indeed. Uh. Trying, to, trying to get me there. All right. Um, if you need a Bible, we're going to continue in what we started reading in Luke 24. And if you don't own a copy of the Bible, we'd love to put one in your hand. So simply slip your hand up. They'll give you a copy, and we'll go to Luke 24. And uh, we'll continue um, what was started by Lonnie in verse 13 is where we'll be. So Luke 24, and we'll start in verse 13. If you don't have a Bible uh, or you prefer this copy, feel free to keep it. If not, just leave it on the chair. We'll pick it up at the end. Um, I'll pray, and we're going to look at the continuation of the resurrection story. Jesus, we do thank you for another day that we get to worship you and to celebrate your faithfulness towards us. Uh, we just confess we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you working and striving and pursuing us because, Lord, we've been selfish. and We've gone our own way. We've ignored you. We've rebelled against you, and uh, we just want to own up to that. But in your love, we remember that you came chasing and that you sent your son Jesus to provide a way of escape so that we can know you, the living God, and live forever. So thank you for this gift, and Lord, we want to remember it, we want to live in light of it. So help us to see you more clearly. We pray in Jesus' name, uh, amen. Easter uh, is, it's a holiday with like mixed emotions, because for some people, it's simply like there's a winter holiday, Christmas, right? And then there's a spring holiday, so it's a time to plant new seeds, do eggs, chocolate, you know, pastel colors, it's my one time of year to wear a color, and it's usually black followed by gray. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's just a spring thing, a summer thing, and, and that's cool uh, for some. But for others of us here, we see Easter as the highlight of the year because all that God had been doing, and we celebrate what God's doing all year round, but when you look at the Bible, all that God had been doing is leading up to this moment where Jesus would provide a victory, a way a real escape from our real prison of being alienated from God and pushed away from God, not because he doesn't like us, but because we rebel against him. And so this is like the high point of the year for us. Jesus died and rose again to rescue sin-filled people like us. That's what Easter is celebrating. And he accomplished it by proving that life is his to give. Why? Jesus rose again. He's alive and he still changes our lives. And that's why we're here, right? Some of you are like, yeah, party on, bring it on. Like, give me the donuts. I'm ready. And um, for others, though, Easter is just intriguing. It's, it's mysterious. And you may be here this morning. A friend said, hey, it's Easter. Why don't you come to me in the church? And thank you for coming. And we just want to confess that there are all sorts of questions around who God is and who Jesus is and what he's done and how to connect with him. And so could this be real? Hopefully, your eyes will be open to something you didn't know before. If it's real, what do I do with it? What does it mean for like my day-to-day -day life? Hopefully, by coming and listening to various stories this morning, you're going to get a, a better sense of what God is doing. You just need to know this. If you have questions or you have doubts or you're not sure, you're in a great place. Because as we look at the actual story of what happened, everyone started with doubt and everyone started with questions. And no one, hear me, no one in the early account believed, except a few women, which says a lot about life. They were the first ones to recognize what God is doing. They were the ones who got it. The angel said to them, he's not here. And, and they took God's witness as true. But the rest of the guys were slow to believe and they needed evidence. And if you're here this morning and something hasn't clicked yet, that's not bad on you. Well done for asking good questions. What we want to do is think about what Easter means and if this is real, what this can mean for your life. Uh, in order to do that, let's just read about this first early encounter. Jesus has just risen. And now Luke 24, verse 13, in your Bible or if not, you can look on the screen. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had just happened. That's like Good Friday, the cross and the burial of Jesus. 
And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still and their faces were downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And I love Jesus. What things? He asked. <laughs> well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people and the pre chief priests and our rulers. They handed him over to the Romans, that is, to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem or rescue or save Israel. That's all of these people that were looking for God's salvation. And what's more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In other words, he's long gone now. It's over. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. Uh, just pausing here for a second, this is interesting. They're retelling the story of the resurrection, but they're not sure. <laughs> they're like just saying, here's what's happened, and we don't even know what to make of it. And look at, look at what the mysterious Jesus says in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Then, beginning with Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, which he just continues through the rest of what they had in their Bible. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And mind you, they don't know it's him yet. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, you know, stay with us. It's nearly the evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and he stayed with them. And when he came at the table, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And so they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And then they got up, mind you, it's nighttime, returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven those were Jesus' closest followers, and those who were with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he, when he broke the bread. I think this is gonna be so helpful for us. Here in church 2,000 years later, as we're looking at the Bible, the scriptures, and as we're trying to figure out what that meant to them and what this means to us, I think... This morning, I want us to capture a bit of surprise. The problem with knowing the end of a story, if you want to kill a good story, read the last chapter first and then go back to the beginning. You know, like just read the end where it all comes to conclusion, then go back to the beginning. It's like, oh, it's going to, especially if it's a mystery, it's just going to, it's going to kill it because something happens as a story unfolds. Well, this really happened. And the problem for us in getting it is we've heard it so often. And we think we know, we think we know it. And that's what I want us to get at. There is a surprise here. And I want to think for just a couple of minutes about the surprises they were experiencing. And then I want you to be caught up in the surprises of a few people in our community. So we're going to hear from, from three couples. Here there's two people, Cleopas and, uh, Cleopas and someone else. Could it be another guy? Could it be a lady? Could it have been a... Could have been a husband, wife, could have been brother, sister. We don't know, but there's two people going along and Jesus becomes very real to them. We're gonna get three examples this morning of how Jesus is still showing himself to be true in our day. Now, what was surprising on the first Easter morning? Just three things to, to get our, our minds and imaginations thinking. I think they were surprised by the way God rescues. You know, if there's a God and he knows us and he loves us, how is he gonna make something beautiful out of the mess that we've made. I think we'd all agree, the world's in a bit of a mess. Our lives are messy, our workplaces are messy, our schools are messy, 
Uh, we have these dreams of everything being better, right? But how, if there's a God, then how is he going to bring it back? How is he going to take messy things and put the pieces together again? And what surprised them was the very way that God has chosen to save us. Remember, they had their Bible. So all Jesus did was point to the things that he had said over hundreds of years, even thousands of years that had been leading up. You know, we need to remember that all of the Bible, the beginning to the end, it all points to one great act of rescue in Jesus. The whole center of the story is Jesus. It's not the garden at the beginning where God makes man and woman. It's not the pages after where we make complete messes of our lives. It's not even that God continues to send messengers, prophets in their case, messengers to warn us and remind us God loves us. God loves you, but you can't just reject them and expect things to work out. And that's what we want. We want life on our terms. And when we're in total chaos, we want God to step in. And so God lovingly warns us, I'm calling you, I'm calling you. My way is the better way. My life is the better life. Why don't you listen? And in the end, when we look at the whole of the Bible, what Jesus reminds us is he is the center all of these things, he says, are pointing to me. So Jesus says to them, did not the Messiah, verse 26, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In other words, the, the resurrection shouldn't be a surprise. God had been hinting at what's going to happen, and now you've seen it happen. So beginning with Moses and the prophets, all Jesus does is connect the dots. And this morning, I just want to encourage you, there may be some dots that haven't connected yet. Well done for coming. I encourage you, if you came with a friend or a family member, ask those questions because guess what? There are real answers. This isn't blind faith. We don't just blindly believe something on a page. There's evidence that's been given to us by God himself that Jesus is the promised one to come and that Jesus alone died and rose again to set us free, life for life. The wages of our sin, what we deserve when we rebel, is to be alienated, moved away from a God who's perfect. The wages of sin in the end is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God that he wants to give every single person in this room is new life and a fresh start in our past, not just looked over, but actually taken care of. Real forgiveness, real grace, real new start. And this is shocking to them. They thought that when God would send someone they were going to take over the human government and rule again and make the Jews in charge. They knew part of what God was doing, but not all. And can I just suggest to you, you probably already have a sense of what God has done, but he wants to connect all the dots. And in this sense, all of the Bible is pointing us to this perfect work of Jesus. It's why we celebrate Holy Week. It's why we come on Good Friday and remember the sacrifice of Jesus. It's why we're here this morning and, and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. God's way of doing it is a surprise. Now, I will be the first to admit, if I were God, I don't know if I would have done it this way. But I'm not God, right? So what we could do is humble ourselves and say, you know what? We may think we know what it's going to take to make sense of our life. And we may think we know what, it, what it's going to take to bring health to the, to the brokenness or forgiveness or whatever. Can I just suggest to you that God has made his way known. And it is the best way. It's the only complete way. And it's in and through Jesus. Now, this was news to them. It was absolute news. And it may be news to you this morning. Keep asking those questions. The second thing I think they're surprised by is the surprise that Jesus is walking with them. Remember, here they are. And they're down the road. They're, they're expecting Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem, to do something miraculous. And then they hear that he's dead. So their hopes are gone because the person that they're trusting in is no longer here and everyone's been to the tomb and there's a real stone and, and it's, it's rolled in front and you can't see him and it's over. And then suddenly, what they don't realize is that the entire time on their little seven-mile journey towards Emmaus, Jesus is, is with them. Jesus is talking to them. Jesus is asking them questions. Now, this may be a surprise to you, but it's no surprise to me. Do you know what? God has been speaking to you. God 
has been working in your world, and if God seems far off, this may be a shocker. He's closer than you think. And there are things that you have gone through and you didn't see the evidence of Jesus. I'm here to remind you, these two did not see initially the evidence of Jesus' presence. But God is so loving and caring that he's with us even when we're trying to run away. He's with you even in the middle of your sticking a finger in his direction. He's in the middle of your rebellion calling you with love, follow me. And so I think one day when those of us who follow Jesus see him face to face, we'll get a bit of a record of, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Do you know there were accidents you should have been destroyed by and God protected you? There were moments of loneliness that were so low, you didn't know you were going to make it and you probably weren't going to make it, but God in his love sent someone your way. Even the Bible tells us that there are moments where we, we may be entertaining, that's not like feeding them dinner, but in the presence of God's messengers, God's angels, and we don't even know it. God is all over his world, and he's all over your life, and he loves you that much, and this was a surprise. Now, what had to happen? Their eyes are open. And I think there comes a time when everyone's life, especially all of those of us who are following Jesus, where we look back and we, we can start connecting the dots. Like, oh my gosh. That was you, God. And I want us to hear a little bit about that this morning from people who have gone through some gnarly stuff. Where has Jesus, let me ask you, where has Jesus been where you weren't aware of him? It's something we don't think about. We think of God as maybe standoffish and far, or maybe we just feel so guilty because we know we messed up. We're like, he's not interested in me, not True, that's a surprise. They didn't recognize God's plan was Jesus and a cross and life for life, like his life paying for what we've done and then his resurrection giving us the promise that we too who follow him and are set free get to live forever with him. They didn't get it, we don't get it and keep asking. God will surprise you with answers. The third surprise I think we see here is that their surprise he's, Jesus is really alive. Like, this is, this is news. Verse 31, then their eyes were open and they recognized him. And I love it. And he disappeared from their sight. Like, did they shake hands? Did he walk away? Did he mister? Like, I, I don't know what the text is implying. All I know is one moment he's there and then one moment he's not. And then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked and opened the scriptures to us. And here's the cool thing about God. There are moments in your life where you recognize he's closer and you're like, whoa, and you feel it. And I hope that that happens this morning. It's a beautiful thing when our eyes are open to what God's doing. And that's why we celebrate not just once a year, the victory of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, but we celebrate every week. And in homes, we celebrate in the middle of the week. And when we wake up in the morning, we read the scriptures and we talk to God because Jesus is really alive. And how do you know that they got it? It's what happens next. Remember, I said, this is the middle of the night. They told the stranger, they thought, Jesus, hey, stay with us. It's already getting late. There are no street lights, people. They're in the Middle East, it's first century. To walk in the dark is dangerous. There's no iPhone with flashlight. And so what do they do? In the middle of the dark, right? They find a way seven miles back to Jerusalem. They hunt down the other disciples who are in a room scared. Why? They kill Jesus, they're gonna get us next. How do you take that down a regime? Start with the leader and then get all the followers and it's over. They're scared, they don't recognize Jesus is really alive and they go and they witness what is what is a witness? They say what they've seen and they've heard. They have realized this Jesus is truly alive and they tell the story. Not everyone in the first few days following the resurrection saw Jesus themselves. But most of the people who ended up becoming one of his followers heard it through the testimony of someone who had that firsthand experience. And so those who didn't see themselves are just like us. You see, I, I've never seen Jesus risen from the grave, but I know and I have evidence, not only from the scripture, not only from history, but from the lives of untold people, including myself, who've encountered his risenness. His realness has become true and real to me, 
And my life can share to you and to others that if you don't trust him, you should. And here's why. So what does the resurrection mean to us today? Like what what does it mean for Jesus to be alive in 2019? What I want us to do now is to hear some stories of some people in our community who have gone through things, had moments like walking down the road wondering what to do next, and in that have found Jesus to be very real to them. I'm gonna invite uh, Christian and Rhonda Isaacson to come. Why don't you welcome them as they come? And and so as as they come, they're they're going to share a little bit of their story. Uh, We'll start with the basics. Uh, Christian, Rhonda, hello. And you have been married for how long now? How many many years? Just about like 26. About about, (laughs) about 26? I said said 26 years, three months, and 17 days. Okay, he's a particular man with particular (laughs) skills. He knows things. All right, so 26 years, give or take. And then you both, um, when did you start following Jesus? When did that happen in both of your lives? I was a little girl. I was eight Mm -hmm. years old. Um, I had grown up in Sunday school, but eight years old when I decided to follow Jesus and decided to get baptized. Yeah, so eight and how about you? Same. I grew up in Sunday school. Same. So so often we hear the message of God's faithfulness through other people, and that's a beautiful thing. Well, we met about three and a half years ago in the strangest of ways. I got a text on a Friday. I can't remember who, someone in our church, who said there's someone in the hospital that has been going to your church and they may not make it. Can you go to the ER and, and visit them? So like, oh my gosh, I happen to live like five minutes from the hospital and so went and into your room and saw you and your son there. And uh, tell us what happened, Christian. Uh, I was in a bike accident. I was on a, uh, on a 10 speed bike. It's not as cool as a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> long story short, I broke seven ribs, uh, Shattered my clavicle and then punctured my collapsed my lung. Yeah, and then um, it, it ended up in, in a long stay at the hospital. And so this happened where? where I was in it? Hawaii. Okay. I got on the plane a couple days um, sooner than I probably should have, and my lung collapsed mid-flight, and I thought I was um, not going to land. Um, yeah. And uh, then when I land, I was within hours. I was at tubes everywhere and. Um, I was in the, in the hospital. So. And you both, you get this because, I mean, you're a health professional. What do you do for a living? I'm a firefighter. And so as someone who understands you're at, you're at you see people mm-hmm. die or are close to it regularly. Now you're the one in the hospital. Rhonda, what's going through your mind? I mean, you both have been following Jesus a long time. You're married, you're raising your kids, and suddenly it all changes. What was going through your mind? Uh, well, this was definitely one of those times when your eyes are open to see, like, what are you doing, God, after just countless hours of preparation for the race and um, being close to taking over third place and just the excitement of doing really well um, to crashing yeah. and ending up in, in the hospital where I just I, I felt devastated for him just for the disappointment of being pulled from the race. And then... Um, just as a wife feeling helpless and watching your husband suffer. And then, I mean, broken ribs is a really painful yeah. injury. And um, so it was just really, really a difficult time to watch him go through that. And you say a race, maybe. And maybe, I maybe, lost. He, like, he, was on a ten, <laughs> he was on a 10 speed. Okay, what was the race? Uh, I was racing the Ultraman World Championship in Kona. Uh, what, what is the Ultraman? The Ultraman is a six mile swim, a 270 mile. In the mile. ocean. Okay, continue. <laughs> Six mile swim. In the ocean. 270 mile bike and then a 52 mile run. In three days. So you've trained all this energy. You're exhausted. You crash on the course. Mm -hmm. A truck could have run you over. Correct. And then we're in the hospital and you don't know. So uh, in the process, because it happened now three Three years ago. Three years ago. Where have you seen Jesus? Because I think at moments, like the two on the road, it seems like, God, what have you done? Where, where, what are some ways that you've seen Jesus at work? Um, I think for me personally, uh, I came to the, con- not come to the conclusion, but I realized that in, in something that I felt like I was given a gift to do, um, I don't think that there's anything that God consider that we would consider too important, that he won't use to have us draw closer to him. Yeah. Um, 
And that was what I found um, at night um, in the emergency or in the ICU when I was in there. Uh, as I had doctors telling me, "You're never gonna, you're never gonna have a left lung. My lung wouldn't inflate. You're never gonna. Your your things are not gonna be the same for you again." Yeah. Um, I just really felt. Um, a sense of peace, and, 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 and honestly, at that time, we had, we had just come to the church, you know, we'd been here for six months, and I think God used the, the, the people in the, in the community here to really love on us in a way that we, only, we could only know that it was Christ sending his comfort to us, yeah. um, being new, new, new to the community. And, you know, as, as a wife and a mom, um, you get these moments where you realize, my husband may be gone. And uh, out of that, where did, where did Jesus make a difference? Did you sense his presence? How, how did that become real yeah, to you? I definitely um, did feel just a sense of peace while he is in the hospital thinking these thoughts of like, oh, I might not pull through this. I don't remember having that fear. Yeah. I feel like um, so many people were just praying for me and I had faith that he would be healed. There were still enough questions about what the future would look like as far as going back to work and right. mm -hmm. um, just how he would recover uh, to keep me close to God, to keep me praying and to keep me um, just seeking his presence. And I, I was really bolstered by the prayers and just the, the thoughts and the kindnesses shown to us by this community, even though we were pretty new here at this church. Yeah. There was just an outpouring of support and visits and food, and um, I'm really thankful for this family. Where is Jesus at work? He's at work in the lives of the other people around us. That's interesting. We see God at work through his own people who follow him. And so in the end, um, you were doubting you'd ever race again. What's the status report? Have you been able to get out there? Yep, I did. Uh... <laughs> oh, he has. I have. Um, I, oh. Eight weeks ago, yesterday, actually, I raced Ultraman Florida, um, and um, I took third. So There you go. Look at that. I know. It's exciting. Thank you, guys. You know, God's faithful doesn't always work out the way we intended, but in this particular case, God in his mercy saved your life, reinflated your lung, mm -hmm. and has given you the, the ability to race mm -hmm. again. Uh, Christian and Rhonda Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. And uh, at the same time... I want to invite Steve and Vicki Marshman. Sometimes life throws you a curveball in an accident. Like he was engaging in what he loves, doing what he loves, and next thing you know, it, he's in the hospital. But other times, things become a surprise. Like we weren't looking for it, and it comes our way. Hello, guys. Hi. Uh, so Steve and Vicki. Uh, we're going to hear mostly from Vicki because Steve, you recognize, he's one of our elders. He's one of our teachers. And so uh, we don't get to hear from Vicki often. So thank you, Steve, for standing there. Um, <laughs> He does it well. Yeah. Eye candy. Uh, so you've been married now how long? More than 26 years? Yeah, almost 36. 36 almost 36 and years. And your faith story, uh, when did both of you, like, when did you start following Jesus? How did that happen? Well, I became a Christian when I was 23, and that's all due to Steve. We were dating, and he had asked me to marry him, and we started going through premarital counseling, and yeah. the pastor found out I wasn't a Christian, and... Things need to be changed. So, <laughs> yeah. So, like, how, give us some more detail on that yeah, one. So, I, I became a Christian freshman at college and senior year of college. I met Vicky, instantly fell in love, hadn't read the passage about unequally yoked yet. Then I asked her to marry me. And then we, the marriage counseling was very challenging. It was just a, the pastor said, You can't do that. What? <laughs> but uh, so fortunately, I'd already talked to Vicky a lot about Jesus, and you know, looking back, she was she was most of the way there. And uh, praise Jesus, she uh, she said yes, I'm going to follow him, and then we got married. So yeah. give us your background because you're both studying at Air Force <clears throat> Academy. What were you studying? Aerospace engineering. Over my head. And you, what were you studying? Engineering physics. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> There are not a lot of history majors. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you, you're both uh, drawn to science and engineering and thought and process, but Jesus has become convincing to you. You've grown in him. And then one year ago, not to the date, but the day after Easter, which was April the 2nd, 2nd last of last year, you got some terrible news. I did. Um, I'd been struggling with some health issues for a while, and the doctors have been trying to figure it out. And it had taken, gee, almost a year um, they did a bone marrow biopsy on the, 
the day before Easter, and then I got the phone call on the day after that I had leukemia. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't know, leukemia is a type of cancer where your bone marrow stops producing, for me, white blood cells. So most people that get it undiagnosed die from an infection that their body can't fight off. And so we had all been praying because you've been struggling for like some years now. And, yeah. But then you get that, and then give us a little bit, I mean, you've been poked and prodded by just about everybody, but a little bit of the process <laughs> of, you hear leukemia, what did that mean for you? What did that, what happened next? Well, it meant shock, and then it meant that on April 3rd, I was in the hospital at St. Vincent's, Vincent's undergoing my first round of chemo, which was designed to kill my bone marrow, so I would stop producing leukemia cells, mm. and then um, sitting down with the doctor and saying, because of the type of leukemia I had, doing this was good, I was in remission, but I had a, a three in four chance of dying anyway, because my body was just going to produce more leukemia if they didn't do anything. So after that first round of chemo, they said that my best option was a bone marrow transplant. And then everyone starts praying because that's, you know, finding matches. I mean, how oh. many people are just on a list waiting for a match? But God had an interesting surprise for you. God had a great surprise for me. Um, God's hand was just all over this. I have one sibling. I have a sister. She's a year younger than me. And siblings are good matches but there's only a one in four chance that they will match. When they match for a bone marrow donor, there are 14 points that they look for in between you and your donor. Um, they'll do the bone marrow transplant at 10 or above. My sister was all 14. 14, that's incredible. Just thank God, I mean, that's just, what a gift. I mean, like, you are, you and your sister are uniquely one in, in when it comes we to bone marrow. And I'm just going to tell you, you be nice to your siblings. Yes. <laughs> Side note, Jesus is risen. Don't kick your sister. Oh. <laughs> um, so in that, like no joke, um, I think maybe I'm wrong on this. We'll, I'll go on a limb. If, if you have something taken out, like you have the imprint of your sister because you have her marrow. Oh, right? yeah. It's the coolest thing. If my marrow, if my donor had been a guy and I left blood at a crime scene, they'd be looking for a guy. <laughs> Now they're just looking for her sister. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, when in doubt, you didn't do it. You weren't there. And so, Steve, just help us for a second. You know, as a your dad, a husband, you're now grandparents. So, well, well, take us back. Uh, Vicki, when you get this news, you're like, grandchildren are starting to come. Oh, man. This was, this was probably one of the hardest parts. This hit, my first grandchild was going to turn one. My second grandchild was one month old, and I just found out that there was going to be a third. Yeah. And I'm sitting in that hospital, and they're pumping poison in, and we're not sure if it's going to work. And I'm thinking, am I ever even going to see the third one? Am I ever going to hold the second one again? I mean, I was there for the birth, and then that was it. Yeah. The first one would, it was just starting to call me grandma. Oh, gosh. And I'm like, okay, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah, and just to add to that, I'll, I'll never forget when we first got the news, uh, we were literally speechless because we were crying so much. And uh, at that time, Nakai didn't have a name. She wasn't born yet. Uh, but Vicky's first words out of her mouth when she could finally speak was, um, sorry. She said, I'm not going to be able to see my granddaughter. And praise Jesus. Now she holds her. I held her this morning. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, we ought to thank God. So just give us in a short statement. You know, Jesus is risen. We believe that. Where has it become real to you through this experience? Maybe start with Steve. And where has this become real? Yeah, it's, it's changed because it's a long journey. Uh, it's been a year, and we've got more years to go. But uh, at, at first, it was mostly just thanking God that, He's prepared Vicky, and she had a deep faith going into this, you know, years of worship and reading her Bible and church and raising two good kids that got married to two great guys and my brother and my sister-in-law and just yeah. all this around us that we were, we were prepared because of, of our faith. Not that we had any great faith, but, but we had a faith going into it. 
And then over the, over the year, what started to become really, really obvious to me is that faith is contagious. Uh, there was days where I was really down and Vicky's strong faith lifted me up and, and vice versa and my family and many of you in the church. Uh, and I, I just become absolutely convinced that we're not supposed to have faith in isolation because our faith together is just so much, so much stronger. Yeah. You've been closer to death than most of us. So Jesus, you know, how has he been real to you? Um, you know, I just got to be honest. He's always there. Yeah. He was there every time I needed him to be there, even when I didn't know that's, that's what I needed. You're, you're sitting in a hospital bed, and it's the middle of the night because they've woken you up one more time to take vitals, and they must do that. <laughs> and and you're, just, you're just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I remember you talked about Jesus in the garden. I, I know that feeling. God, you know, if there's another way to do this, I would like to not do this path. And yet he was still there. And I would open my Bible and, and read verses. And that was the year we were reading through the Bible. And I was a little behind, just a little. And I'm reading through Psalms because that's, you know, the early Psalms, David's Psalms. And it's just, uh, he's pouring his heart out to God. And I'm pouring my heart out to God. It's like he's talking for me. And, and you can feel his presence. And then there's just so many little miracles my sister being a great match. I spent, for my first round of chemo, I spent less time in the hospital than most people. I just, my really bounced back from that, and that was such a blessing. Because for those of you that have been there, it'll long-term stay in the hospital. It's not a lot of fun. That mm -hmm. menu is limited. <laughs> 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 and there's only so many times you can eat mac and cheese. <laughs> so, but, but he was there. And, so many of you prayed for me, and I just want to thank you for that. And I felt those prayers. I want you yeah. to know that. There were days he would send out email updates, and you could just feel, just feel the comfort in God's closeness through that. And the, guy, the ones of you that actually came up and spent time with me, I thank you for that. For those of you that have ever given blood, I needed several blood transfusions. Thank you for that. That makes a difference. That is a wonderful gift that you can mm -hmm. give. Steve and Vicki Marshman, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. And, uh, you know, I hope you're getting the trend that life can throw curveballs. We have David and Casey Mala. I want you to welcome them as they come. Um, this is, we celebrate that Jesus is risen. What, what does that do for us in times of pain? So we've heard about an accident, you know, while doing a sport and then a sudden illness that goes sour. And then, welcome, guys. Uh, David Casey, you've been a part of the church uh, for a few years now, and when you started, you had no no children. No children. And and things of you are flourishing here. We yeah. are. We're we're very uh, fruitful. You're very active. Um, and so uh, you've been married how long now? Not uh, about eight years. Eight about eight years, and then you uh, give us an update on your family so far. Uh, well, we have a three-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter, and then Casey is pregnant with identical twin girls. Identical twins, I know. Yeah. Yes, which when you get the news, you know, uh, you have two that are <laughs> running around, and then two more yeah. yes. at the same time. Yeah, it's quite the surprise. <laughs> yeah, and twins, is that a family thing or not? No, it no. doesn't run in our family. Um, so, yeah, it was quite the shock when they told us ultrasound that there was two yeah. more <laughs> and and redheads aren't in your family no, historically no. and you, your daughter's is as red, ginger as it gets yes, yes, <laughs> so <she is>. god <laughs> surprises yeah. us right all right so you get the news at first you know fear trembling rejoicing all at the same time mm -hmm. have you calculated diapers on this yes i, I did and have. i posted it on social media so how, how many diapers find me I think it was 680 diapers per month per month 680 diapers per month you thought you had problems. So, um, all right, you, you're moving along, and the doctors have to check on you with twins. Yes. And what did you find yeah. out? Yeah, so um, with the nature of having twins, you have a lot more appointments. Um, so at my 17-week appointment, they did an early anatomy scan of both the girls. Um, well, and, yeah, they're girls. Um, and we were told two things. It was a pretty heavy appointment at that point. Um, the first thing they had shared with us was that one of the girls was missing part of her arm, and they weren't sure if it was due to a genetic issue, um, like, you know, 
chromosomally something was off um, or just the way she was formed. So that was the first piece of the information. And then second, um, with identical twins, they share one placenta. And so with that one placenta, there was unequal sharing between the two girls. Um, and it's called twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Um, and it's very high risk um, if untreated and rapidly, um, it can take the life of both babies. And so we were given this information um, at our yeah. appointment. And I remember you sharing the news and, and what do you, you your, your highest high of like two more babies and then like, oh my goodness, they may not make it. A lot of people prayed, right? And then uh, you, you did have to go to Seattle yeah. to find out more and yeah. what happened. Well, um, there's a clinic up in Seattle that specializes in a high-risk um, surgery to basically alter the placenta to help save the lives of both these of the babies. And um, so the diagnosis had continued to increase, um, and they sent us up to Seattle. We got up to Seattle, um, went through a long appointment with the surgeon in preparation at that point, knowing that we could lose both of them. Um, and finished the ultrasound, and they said, you no longer have this syndrome. It was completely healed. Yeah, wow, wow. So, all right, David. The, the skeptic's gonna say, well, maybe it really wasn't there beforehand. Yeah, so, I mean, to give a little context to that, um, uh, so there's the initial appointment where the doctor dropped you know, all that information and then kind of was like, so do you want to keep going with the pregnancy? You know, like very big appointment. Um, and then for three weeks, it got progressively worse and worse till they were like, yeah, you, you guys need to go to Seattle and do this like crazy microscopic laser surgery. Technology is amazing. Um, yeah. And the you, church prayed for us. We've had... Uh, tons of people praying for us um, and going there and them saying like, yeah, we, actually it's kind of leveled out and we don't need to do it. And then over the last six weeks, since about six weeks or so, uh, uh, it's completely reversed um, over the last six weeks and their levels are like almost identical. Like they're almost completely even. And um, with this twin to twin transfusion syndrome, when they, uh, when it's uh, getting worse and worse like that three weeks in a row, like the odds of it just naturally turning around on its own are like really slim. Yeah. So. But we serve a God who's very much alive and he's working. And so, well, we do want to pray because you still have how many weeks left would be optimal? About five more weeks. We're praying for exactly five weeks and not an hour longer <laughs> for lung development. <laughs> Uh, and let's just pray because we, we are experiencing resurrection. That's what I want you to hear is Jesus is alive and so we can call on him to go in where surgeons can with technology, but God with a thought can change everything. And this is why we rejoice. This is why Easter is big because his being alive means that we can come to him with anything. But let's pray for the Malats, pray for Dave and Casey and the girls. And I'm gonna invite you to stand if you would. And we're gonna ask God to move in, in their life. Um, the, the daughter who, who's missing part of a limb, is Reese? Yeah. Reese, we're gonna pray for Reese. It, uh, God makes everything beautiful. And so if she comes out and she doesn't have that, that's beautiful because God's made her in his image. But we do want to pray that, Lord, uh, if you want to go in there and just change that, that would, be, that would be stellar. And does God do that kind of thing? Well, he just adjusted placentas. I think he can take care of the rest. And we want to call on him because he loves us. So no matter how she's born, we just want to ask him now to do his great work. So join me. Lord, we thank you for David and Casey. We thank you for these beautiful girls. We thank you for what you've already done in her womb to change the situation and turn it around. We see it as not accident or fate. We see it as your hand, Lord Jesus. You're alive and you're still doing miraculous work and your resurrection is being felt even in this room as you adjust 
what's going on in Casey's body. So Lord, now we ask, continue that work. Keep her strong to the end. Lord, we pray that they wouldn't come too early and have undeveloped lungs and all the issues, but on the exact moment where they're ready, Lord, that they would come out and we'd all rejoice on these beautiful girls created in your image, designed to do great things as they follow you. Lord, we love you and we come to you with their needs and our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys, thank you guys. So what do we do? Isn't that awesome? All right, what do we do? Um, where does the resurrection fit in your world? That's the two on the road to Emmaus. That's their experience. We've heard three stories of real people who've chosen to follow Jesus and his realness has been present in the deepest valleys and they've seen God on the mountaintops as well. What about you? I think one of the most discouraging ways to live your life is to push God away. And so Easter is the reminder that he's not even like waiting for you to follow him. He's on the road trying to answer those questions. And I pray this morning some of your doubts have been washed away and some of your questions have been answered about the realness of Jesus. So now what we want to do is those of us who know we want to respond in worship and you're invited. If you're not yet following him, you can right now. The best act of worship you could do is say to Jesus, I am full of sin and I'm not worthy of your presence, but Jesus, you've provided a way and so I'm gonna take you up on your offer. It's your offer of life. Jesus, set me free, clean me and create in me a new heart, a new desire to live according to your ways. And God, I don't even know what to do, but will you walk along the road with me so that I can follow you? Just like the two didn't know, but I wanna walk and follow you. And guess what, friend, if you take one step towards Jesus, you're gonna find he's already taken 100 steps towards you. He's already done it. And so just say yes to him. Right now as we sing the songs, if you feel far from God, forget the lyrics on the screen. It's just saying yes. Just saying like, yes, Jesus, I wanna follow you. And then in a moment, we're gonna take the bread and the cup. These are the reminders of the sacrifice of Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can be put in the right with God. And your first act as a Jesus follower can be to take the bread and the cup and say, Jesus, this is mine. I belong to you. Let's worship, let's sing, and Brandon will lead us to the table to take communion.